Today we have some more actual history from the Western Frontier during the United States Revolution. We will be reading from this book, Incidents of Border Life by Joseph Pritz. This book was published all the way back in 1838. So today's story is a sketch of the early life of Simon Kenton. Kenton was born in Virginia in 1755, but was one of the first American explorers of Kentucky. This story tells about his service as a spy during the Revolutionary War and his subsequent capture and captivity with the Indian tribes who were allied with the British. Simon Kenton was born in Fauquier County, Virginia on the 15th of May, 1755, the ever memorable year of Braddock's defeat. Of his early years, nothing is known. His parents were poor and until the age of 16, his days seemed to have passed away in the obscure and laborious drudgery of a farm. He was never taught to read or write, and to this early negligence or inability on the part of his parents is the poverty and desolation of his old age in a great measure to be attributed. At the age of 16, by an unfortunate adventure, he was launched into life with no other fortune than a stout heart and a robust set of limbs. It seems that, young as he was, his heart had become entangled in the snares of a young coquette in the neighborhood who was grievously perplexed by the necessity of choosing one husband out of many lovers. Young Kenton and a robust farmer by the name of Leichman seemed to have been the most favored suitors, and the young lady not being able to decide upon their respective merits, they took the matter into their own hands, and in consequence of foul play on the part of Leichman's friends, young Kenton was beaten with great severity. He submitted to his fate for the time in silence, but internally vowed that as soon as he had obtained his full growth, he would take ample vengeance upon his rival for the disgrace he had sustained at his hands. He waited patiently until the following spring when, finding himself six feet high and full of health and action, he determined to delay the hour of retribution no longer. He accordingly walked over to Leichman's house one morning, and finding him busily engaged in carrying shingles from the woods to his own house, he stopped him, told him his object, and desired him to adjourn to a spot more convenient for the purpose. Leichman, confident in his superior age and strength, was not backward in testifying his willingness to indulge him in so amiable a pastime, and having reached a solitary spot in the wood, they both stripped and prepared for the encounter. The battle was fought with all the fury which mutual hate, jealousy, and Herculean power on both sides could supply, and after a severe round, in which considerable damage was done and received, Kenton was brought to the ground. Leichman, as usual in Virginia, sprung upon him without the least scruple, and added the most bitter taunts to the kicks with which he saluted him, from his head to his heels, reminding him of the former defeat, and rubbing salt into the raw wounds of jealousy by triumphant allusions to his own superiority both in love and war. During these active operations on the part of Leichman, Kenton lay perfectly still, eyeing attentively a small bush which grew near them. It instantly occurred to him that if he could wind Leichman's hair, which was remarkably long, around this bush, he would be able to return those kicks which now were bestowed upon him in such profusion. The difficulty was to get his antagonist near enough. This he at length effected in good old Virginia style, viz. by biting him in arriere and compelling him by short springs to approach the bush. When near enough, Kenton suddenly exerted himself violently and succeeded in wrapping the long hair of his rival around the sapling. He then sprung to his feet and inflicted a terrible revenge for all his past injuries. In a few seconds, Leichman was gasping, apparently in the agonies of death. Kenton instantly fled without even returning for an additional supply of clothing, and directed his steps westward. During the first day of his journey, he traveled in much agitation. He supposed that Leichman was dead, and that the hue and cry would instantly be raised after himself as the murderer. The constant apprehension of a gallows lent wings to his flight, and he scarcely allowed himself a moment for refreshment until he had reached the neighborhood of the Warm Springs, where the settlements were thin and the immediate danger of pursuit was over. Here he fortunately fell in with an exile from the state of New Jersey, of the name of Johnson, 
who was traveling westward on foot and driving a single pack horse laden with a few necessaries before him. They soon became acquainted, related their adventures to each other, and agreed to travel together. They plunged boldly into the wilderness of the Allegheny Mountains, and subsisting upon wild game and a small quantity of flour, which Johnson had brought with him, they made no halt until they arrived at a small settlement on Cheat River, one of the prongs of the Monongahela. Here the two friends separated and Kenton, who had assumed the name of Butler at that time, attached himself to a small company headed by John Mahon and Jacob Greathouse, who had united for the purpose of exploring the country. They quickly built a large canoe and descended the river as far as the province's settlements. There, Kenton became acquainted with two young adventurers, Jaeger and Strader, the former of whom had been taken by the Indians when a child, and had spent many years in their village. He informed Kenton that there was a country below which the Indians called Kentucky, which was a perfect Elysium, that the ground was not only the richest and the vegetation the most luxuriant in the world, but that the immense herds of buffalo and elk, which ranged at large through its forest, would appear incredible to one who had never witnessed such a spectacle. He added that it was entirely uninhabited and was open to all who chose to hunt there, that he himself had often accompanied the Indians in their grand hunting parties through the country, and was confident that he could conduct him to the same ground if he was willing to venture. Kenton closed with the proposal and announced his readiness to accompany him immediately. A canoe was speedily procured, and the three young men committed themselves to the waters of the Ohio in search of the enchanted hunting ground which Jaeger had visited in his youth while a captive among the Indians. Jaeger had no idea of its exact distance from the province's settlements. He recollected only that he had crossed the Ohio in order to reach it, and declared that by sailing down the river for a few days, they would come to the spot where the Indians were accustomed to cross, and assured Kenton that there would be no difficulty in recognizing it, that its appearance was different from all the rest of the world, etc., etc. Fired by Jaeger's glowing description of its beauty, and eager to reach this new El Dorado of the West, the young men rode hard for several days, confidently expecting that every bend of the river would usher them into the land of promise. No such country, however, appeared, and at length Kenton and Strader became rather skeptical as to its existence at all. They rallied Jaeger freely upon the subject, who still declared positively that they would soon witness the confirmation of all that he had said. After descending, however, as low as the spot where Manchester now stands, and seeing nothing which resembled Jaeger's country, they held a council, in which it was determined to return and survey the country more carefully, Jaeger still insisting that they must have passed it in the night. They accordingly retraced their steps and successfully explored the land around Salt Lake and the little and big Sandy and Guayandate. At length being totally wearied out and searching for what had no existence, they turned their attention entirely to hunting and trapping and spent nearly two years upon the Great Kanawha in this agreeable and profitable occupation. They obtained clothing in exchange for their furs from the traders of Fort Pitt, and the forest supplied them abundantly with wild game for food. In March of 1773, while reposing in their tent, after the labors of the day, they were suddenly attacked by a party of Indians. Strader was killed at the first fire, and Kenton and Jaeger with difficulty effected their escape, being compelled to abandon their guns, blankets, and provisions, and commit themselves to the wilderness without the means of sheltering themselves from the cold, procuring a morsel of food, or even kindling a fire. They were far removed from any white settlement, and had no other prospect than that of perishing by famine or falling sacrifice to the fury of such Indians as might chance to meet them. Reflecting, however, that it was never too late for men to be utterly lost, they determined to strike through the woods for the Ohio River, and take such fortune as it should please heaven to bestow. Directing their route by the barks of the trees, they pressed forward in a straight direction for the Ohio, and during the first two days allayed the piercing pangs of hunger by chewing such roots as they could find on their way. On the fourth day, they often threw themselves upon the ground, determined to await the approach of death and as often were stimulated by the instinctive love of life to arise and resume their journey. On the fifth, they were completely exhausted and were able only to crawl at intervals. In this manner, they traveled about a mile during the day and succeeded by sunset in reaching the banks of the Ohio, 
Here, to their inexpressible joy, they encountered a party of traders from whom they obtained a comfortable supply of provisions. The traders were so much startled at the idea of being exposed to perils, such as those which Kenton and Jaeger had just escaped, that they lost no time in removing from such a dangerous vicinity, and instantly returned to the mouth of the Little Kanawa, where they met with Dr. Briscoe at the head of another exploring party. From him, Kenton obtained a rifle and some ammunition, with which he again plunged alone into the forest and hunted with success until the summer of 73 was far advanced. Returning then to the Little Kanawa, he found a party of 14 men under the direction of Dr. Wood and Hancock Lee, who were descending the Ohio River with the view of joining Captain Bullitt, who was supposed to be at the mouth of Scioto, with a large party. Kenton instantly joined them and descended the river in canoes as far as the three islands, landing frequently and examining the country on each side of the river. At the three islands, they were alarmed by the approach of a large party of Indians, by whom they were compelled to abandon their canoes and strike diagonally through the wilderness for Greenbrier County, Virginia. They suffered much during the journey from fatigue and famine, and were compelled at one time, notwithstanding the danger of their situation, to halt for fourteen days and wait upon Dr. Wood, who had unfortunately been bitten by a copperhead snake, and rendered incapable of moving for that length of time. Upon reaching the settlements, the party separated. Kenton, not wishing to venture to Virginia, having heard nothing of Leichman's recovery, built a canoe on the banks of the Monongahela, and returned to the mouth of the Great Kanawha, hunting with success until the spring of 74, when a war broke out between the Indian tribes and the colonies, occasioned in great measure by the murder of the family of the celebrated Indian chief Logan. Kenton was not in the great battle near the mouth of the Kanawha, but acted as a spy throughout the whole of the campaign in the course of which he traversed the country around Fort Pitts, and a large part of the present state of Ohio. When Dunmore's forces were disbanded, Kenton and company with two others, determined on making a second effort to discover the rich lands bordering on the Ohio, of which Jaeger had spoken. Having built a canoe and provided themselves abundantly with ammunition, they descended the river as far as the mouth of Big Bone Creek, upon which the celebrated lick of the same name is situated. They there disembarked and explored the country for several days, but not finding the land equal to their expectations, they reascended the river as far as the mouth of Cabin Creek, a few miles above Maysville. From this point they set out with a determination to examine the country carefully, until they could find land answering in some degree to Jaeger's description. In a short time they reached the neighborhood of Maze Lake, and for the first time were struck with the uncommon beauty of the country and the fertility of the soil. Here they fell in with the Great Buffalo Trace, which in a few hours brought them to the Lower Blue Lick. The flats upon each side of the river were crowded with immense herds of buffalo that had come down from the interior for the sake of the salt, and a number of elk were seen upon the bare ridges which surrounded the springs. Their great object was now achieved. They had discovered a country far more rich than any which they had yet beheld, and where the game seemed as abundant as the grass of the plain. After remaining a few days at the lick and killing an immense number of deer and buffalo, they crossed the licking and passed through the present counties of Scott, Fayette, Woodford, Clark, Montgomery, and Bath, when falling in with another buffalo trace, it conducted them to the upper blue lick, where they again beheld elk and buffalo in immense numbers. Highly gratified of the success of their expedition, they quickly returned to their canoe and ascended the river as far as Green Bottom, where they had left their skin, some ammunition, and a few hoes, which they had procured at Kanawha with a view of cultivating the rich ground which they expected to find. Returning as quickly as possible, they built a cabin on the spot where the town of Washington now stands, and having cleared an acre of ground in the center of a large cane break, they planted it with Indian corn. Strolling about the country in various directions, they one day fell in with two white men near the lower blue lick, who had lost their guns, blankets, and ammunition, and were much distressed for provisions and the means of extricating themselves from the wilderness. They informed them that their names were Fitzpatrick and Hendricks, that in descending the Ohio River their canoe had been overset by a sudden squall, and that they were compelled to swim ashore without being able to save anything from the wreck. They said that they had wandered thus far through the woods in the effort to penetrate through the country to the settlements above.
but that they would have infallibly perished unless they had been furnished with guns and ammunition. Kenton informed them of the small settlements which he had opened at Washington, and invited them to join him and share such fortune as Providence might bestow. Hendricks consented to remain, but Fitzpatrick, being heartily sick of the woods, insisted upon returning to the Monongahela. Kenton and his two friends accompanied Fitzpatrick to the point, as it was then called, being the spot where Maysville now stands, and having given him a gun, etc., assisted him in crossing the river, and took leave of him on the other side. In the meantime, Hendricks had been left at the Blue Lake without a gun, but with a good supply of provisions, until the party could return from the river. As soon as Fitzpatrick had gone, Kenton and his two friends hastened to return to the lake, not doubting for a moment that they would find Hendricks in camp, as they had left him. Upon arriving at the point where the tent had stood, however, they were alarmed at finding it deserted with evident marks of violence around it. Several bullet holes were to be seen in the poles of which it was constructed, and various articles belonging to Hendricks were tossed about in too negligent a manner to warrant the belief that it had been done by him. At a little distance from the camp, in a low ravine, they observed a thick smoke as if from a fire just beginning to burn. They did not doubt for a moment that Hendricks had fallen into the hands of the Indians, and believing that a party of them were assembled around the fire which was about to be kindled, they betook themselves to their heels, and fled faster and farther than true chivalry perhaps would justify. They remained at a distance until the evening of the next day, when they ventured cautiously to return to camp. The fire was still burning, although faintly, and after carefully reconnoitering the adjacent ground, they ventured at length to approach the spot, and there beheld the skull and bones of their unfortunate friend. He had evidently been roasted to death by a party of Indians, and must have been alive at the time when Kenton and his companion approached on the preceding day. It was a subject of deep regret to the party that they had not reconnoitered the spot more closely, as it was probable that their friend might have been rescued. The number of Indians might have been small, and a brisk and unexpected attack might have dispersed them. Regret, however, was now unavailing, and they sadly retraced their steps to their camp at Washington, pondering upon the uncertainty of their own condition, and upon the danger to which they were hourly exposed from the numerous bands of hostile Indians, who were prowling around them in every direction. They remained at Washington entirely undisturbed until the month of September, when, again visiting the Lick, they saw a white man who informed them that the interior of the country was already occupied by the whites, and that there was a thriving settlement at Boonesboro. Highly gratified at this intelligence, and anxious once more to enjoy the society of men, they broke up their encampment at Washington, and visited the different stations which had been formed in the country. Kenton sustained two sieges in Boonesboro, and served as a spy with equal diligence and success until the summer of 78 when Boone, returning from captivity as has already been mentioned, concerted an expedition against the small Indian town on Paint Creek. Kenton acted as a spy on this expedition, and after crossing the Ohio River, being some distance in advance of the rest, he was suddenly startled by the hearing of a loud laugh from an adjoining thicket, which he was about to enter. Instantly halting, he took his station behind a tree, and waited anxiously for a repetition of the noise. In a few minutes, two Indians approached the spot where he lay, both mounted upon a small pony, and chatting and laughing in a high good humor. Having permitted them to approach within good rifle distance, he raised his gun and, aiming at the breast of the foremost, pulled the trigger. Both Indians fell, one shot dead, the other severely wounded. Their frightened pony galloped back into the cane, giving the alarm to the rest of the party, who were at some distance in the rear. Kenton instantly ran up to scalp the dead man and to tomahawk his wounded companion, according to the usual rule of Western warfare, but when about to put an end to the struggles of the wounded Indian, who did not seem disposed to submit very quietly to the operation, his attention was arrested by a rustling in the case on his right, and turning rapidly in that direction, he beheld two Indians within twenty steps of him, very deliberately taking aim at his person. A quick spring to one side on his part was instantly followed by the flash and report of their rifles. The balls whistled close to his ears, causing him involuntarily to duck his head but doing him no injury. Not liking so hot a neighborhood, and ignorant of the number which might yet be behind, he lost no time in regaining the shelter of the wood, 
leaving the dead Indian unscalped and the wounded man to the care of his friends. Scarcely had he treed when a dozen Indians appeared on the edge of the cane break and seemed disposed to press upon him with more vigor than was consistent with the safety of his present position. His fears, however, were instantly relieved by the appearance of Boone and his party, who came running up as rapidly as due regard for the shelter of their persons would permit, and opening a brisk fire upon the Indians, quickly compelled them to regain the shelter of the cane break, with the loss of several wounded who, as usual, were carried off. The dead Indian in the hurry of the retreat was abandoned, and Kenton at last had the gratification of taking his scalp. Boone, as has already been mentioned, instantly retraced his steps to Boonesboro, but Kenton and his friend Montgomery determined to proceed alone to the Indian town and at least obtain some recompense for the trouble of their journey. Approaching the village with a cautious and stealthy pace of the cat or panther, they took their stations upon the edge of the cornfield. Supposing that the Indians would enter it as usual to gather roasting ears, they remained here patiently all day but did not see a single Indian and heard only the voices of some children who were playing near them. Being disappointed in the hope of getting a shot, they entered the Indian town in the night, and stealing four good horses, they made a rapid night's march for the Ohio River, which they crossed in safety and on the second day afterwards they reached Logan's Fort with their booty. Scarcely had he returned when Colonel Bowman ordered him to take his friend Montgomery and another young man named Clark and go on a secret expedition to an Indian town in the Little Miami, against which the colonel meditated an expedition, and of the exact condition of which he wished to have certain information. They instantly set out in obedience to their orders and reached the neighborhood of the town without being discovered. They examined it attentively and walked around the houses during the night with perfect impunity. Thus far all had gone well, and had they been contented to return after the due execution of their orders, they would have avoided the heavy calamity which awaited them. But unfortunately, during their nightly promenade, they stumbled upon a pound in which were a number of Indian horses. The temptation was not to be resisted. They each mounted a horse, but not satisfied with that, they could not find it in their hearts to leave a single animal behind them, and as some of the horses seemed indisposed to change masters, the affair was attended with so much fracas that at last they were discovered. The cry ran through the village at once that the long knives were stealing their horses right before the doors of their wigwams. The old and young, squaws, boys, and warriors all sallied out with loud screams to save their property from these greedy spoilers. Kenton and his friends quickly discovered that they had overshot the mark and that they must ride for their lives, but even in this extremity they could not bring themselves to give up a single horse which they had haltered, and while two of them rode in front and led, I know not how many horses, the other brought up the rear and plying his whip from right to left did not permit a single animal to lag behind. In this manner they had dashed through the woods at a furious rate, with the hue and cry after them, until their course was suddenly stopped by an impenetrable swamp. Here from necessity they paused for a few moments and listened attentively. Hearing no sounds of pursuit, they resumed their course and, skirting the swamp for some distance, in the vain hope of crossing it, they bent their course in a straight direction towards the Ohio. They rode during the whole night without resting a moment, and halting for a few minutes at daylight, they continued their journey throughout the day, and by this uncommon expedition, on the morning of the second day they reached the northern bank of the Ohio. Crossing the river would now ensure their safety, but this was likely to prove a difficult undertaking, and the close pursuit with which they had reason to expect rendered it necessary to lose as little time as possible. The wind was high and the river rough and boisterous. It was determined that Kenton should cross with the horses, while Clark and Montgomery should construct a raft in order to transport their guns, baggage, and ammunition to the opposite shore. The necessary preparations were soon made, and Kenton, after forcing his horses into the river, plunged in himself and swam by their side. In a very few minutes, the high waves completely overwhelmed him and forced him considerably below the horses, which stemmed the current much more vigorously than himself. The horses being thus left to themselves turned about and swam to the Ohio shore, where Kenton was compelled to follow them. Again he forced them into the water, and again they returned to the same spot, until Kenton became so exhausted by repeated efforts as to be unable to swim.
A council was then held and the question proposed, what was to be done? That the Indians would pursue them was certain, that the horses would not and could not be made to cross the river in its present state was equally certain. Should they abandon their horses and cross on the raft, or remain with their horses and take such fortune as heaven should send? The latter alternative was unanimously adopted. Death or captivity might be tolerated, but to lose so beautiful a lot of horses, after having worked so hard for them, was not to be thought of for a moment. As soon as it was determined that themselves and horses were to share the same fate, it again became necessary to fix upon some probable plan of saving them, should they move up or down the river or remain where they were. The latter course was adopted. It was supposed that the wind would fall at sunset, and the river would become sufficiently calm to admit of their passage and as it was supposed probable that the Indians might be upon them before night, it was determined to conceal the horses in a neighboring ravine, while they should take their stations in the adjoining wood. A more miserable plan could not have been adopted. If they could not consent to sacrifice their horses in order to save their own lives, they should have moved either up or down the river, and thus have preserved the distance from the Indians which their rapidity of movement had gained. The Indians would have followed their trail, and being twenty-four hours' march behind, them could never have overtaken them, but neglecting this obvious consideration they stupidly sat down until sunset, expecting that the river would become more calm. The day passed away in tranquility, but at night the wind blew harder than ever, and the water became so rough that even their raft would have been scarcely able to cross. Not an instant more should have been lost in moving from so dangerous a post. But, as if totally infatuated, they remained where they were until morning, thus wasting twenty-four hours of most precious time in total idleness. In the morning the wind abated and the river became calm, but it was now too late. Their horses, recollecting the difficulty of the passage on the preceding day, had become as obstinate and heedless as their masters, and positively and repeatedly refused to take the water. Finding every effort to compel them entirely unavailing, their masters at length determined to do what ought to have been done at first. Each resolved to mount a horse and make the best of his way down the river to Louisville. Had even this resolution, however tardily adopted, been executed with decision, the party would probably have been saved. But after they were mounted, instead of leaving the ground instantly, they went back upon their own trail in the vain effort to regain possession of the rest of their horses, which had broken with them in the last effort to drive them into the water. They wearied out their good genius and literally fell victims to their love of horse flesh. They had scarcely ridden one hundred yards, Kenton in the center, the others upon the flanks, with an interval of two hundred yards between them, when Kenton heard a loud halloo apparently coming from the spot which they had just left. Instead of getting out of the way as soon as possible, and trusting to the speed of his horse and the thickness of the wood for safety, he put the last capping stone to his imprudence, and dismounting walked leisurely back to meet his pursuers, and thus gave them as little trouble as possible. He quickly beheld three Indians and one white man all well mounted. Wishing to give the alarm to his companions, he raised his rifle to his shoulder, took a steady aim at the breast of the foremost Indian, and drew the trigger. His gun had become wet on the raft and flashed. The enemy were instantly alarmed and dashed at him. Now at last, when flight could be of no service, Kenton betook himself to his heels, and was pursued by four horsemen at full speed. He instantly directed his steps to the thickest part of the wood, where there was much fallen timber and rank growth of underwood, and had succeeded as he thought in baffling his pursuers, when, just as he was leaving the fallen timber and entering upon the open wood, an Indian on horseback galloped round the corner of the wood, and approached him so rapidly as to render flight useless. The horseman rode up, holding out his hand and calling out, Brother, brother, in a tone of great affection. Kenton observes that if his gun would have made fire, he would have brothered him to his heart's content. But being totally unarmed, he called out that he would surrender if they would give him quarter and good treatment. Promises were cheap with the Indian, and he showered them out by the dozen, continuing all the while to advance with extended hands and a writhing grin upon his countenance, which was intended for a smile of courtesy. Seizing Kenton's hand, he grasped it with violence. Kenton, not liking the manner of his captor, raised his gun to knock him down, when an Indian who had followed him closely through the brushwood instantly sprung upon his back and pinioned his arms to his side. 
The one who had just approached him then seized him by the hair and shook him until his teeth rattled, while the rest of the party coming up, they all fell upon Kenton with their tongs and ramrods until he thought they would scold or beat him to death. They were the owners of the horses which he had carried off, and now took ample revenge for the loss of their property. At every stroke of their ramrods over his head, and they were neither few nor far between, they would repeat in a tone of strong indignation, Steel Indian hoss, hey! Their attention, however, was soon directed to Montgomery, who, having heard the noise attending Kenton's capture, very gallantly hastened up to his assistance, while Clark very prudently consulted his own safety by betaking himself to his heels, leaving his unfortunate companions to shift for themselves. Montgomery halted within gunshot and appeared busy with the pan of his gun, as if preparing to fire. Two Indians instantly sprung off in pursuit of him, while the rest attended to Kenton. In a few minutes, Kenton heard the crack of two rifles in quick succession, followed by a halloo, which announced the fate of his friend. The Indians quickly returned, waving the bloody scalp of Montgomery, and with countenances and gestures which menaced him with a similar fate. They then proceeded to secure their prisoner. They first compelled him to lie upon his back and stretch out his arms to their full length. They then passed a stout stick at right angles across his breast, to each extremity to which his wrists were fastened by thongs made of buffalo's hide. Stakes were then driven into the earth near his feet, which were then fastened in a similar manner. A halter was then tied around his neck, and fastened to a sapling which grew near, and finally a strong rope was passed under his body, lashed strongly to the pole which lay transversely upon his breast, and finally wrapped around his arms at the elbows, in such a manner as to pinion them to the pole with a painful violence, and render him literally incapable of moving hand, foot, or head in the slightest manner. During the whole of this severe operation, neither their tongues nor their hands were by any means idle. They cuffed him from time to time with great heartiness, until his ears rang again, and abused him for a thief, a hostile, a rascal, and finally for a dead white man. I may here observe that all the Western Indians had picked up a good many English words, particularly our oaths, which, from the frequency with which they were used by our hunters and traders, they probably looked upon as the very root and foundation of the English language. Kenton remained in this painful attitude throughout the night, looking forward to certain death, and most probably torture as soon as he should reach their towns. Their rage against him seemed to increase rather than abate from indulgence, and in the morning it displayed itself in a form at once ludicrous and cruel. Among the horses which Kenton had taken, and which their original owners had now recovered, was a fine but wild young colt, totally unbroken, and with all his honors of mane and tail undocked. Upon him Kenton was mounted without saddle or bridle, with his hands tied behind him, and his feet fastened under the horse's belly. The country was rough and bushy, and Kenton had no means of protecting his face from the brambles, through which it was expected that the colt would dash. As soon as the rider was firmly fastened to his back, the colt was turned loose with a sudden lash, but after exerting a few curvets and caprioles, to the great distress of his rider, but the infinite amusement of the Indians, he appeared to take compassion upon his rider, and falling into a line with the other horses, avoided the brambles entirely, and went on very well. In this manner he rode through the day. At night he was taken from the horse and confined as before. On the third day they came within a few miles of Chillicothe. Here the party halted and dispatched a messenger to inform the village of their arrival, in order, I suppose, to give them time to prepare for his reception. In a short time Blackfish, one of their chiefs, arrived, and regarding Kenton with a stern countenance thundered out in very good English, You have been stealing horses? Yes, sir. Did Captain Boone tell you to steal our horses? No, sir, I did it of my own accord. This frank confession was too irritating to be borne. Blackfish made no reply, but brandishing a hickory switch, which he held in his hand, he applied it so briskly to Kenton's naked back and shoulders as to bring the blood freely and occasion acute pain. Thus, alternately beaten and scolded, he marched on to the village. At the distance of a mile from Chillicothe, he saw every inhabitant of the town, men, women, and children, running out to feast their eyes with a view of the prisoner. 
Every individual down to the smallest child appeared in a paroxysm of rage. They whooped, they yelled, they hooted, they clapped their hands and poured upon him with a flood of abuse, to which all that he had yet received was a gentleness and civility. With loud cries they demanded that their prisoner should be tied to the stake. The hint was instantly complied with. A stake was quickly fastened into the ground. The remnants of Kenton's shirt and breeches were torn from his person. The squaws officiating with great dexterity in both operations, and his hands being tied together and raised above his head were fastened to the top of the stake. The whole party then danced around him until midnight, yelling and screaming in their usual frantic manner, striking him with switches and slapping him with the palms of their hands. He expected every moment to undergo the torture of fire, but that was reserved for another time. They wished to prolong the pleasure of tormenting him as much as possible, and after having caused him to anticipate the bitterness of death until a late hour of the night, they released him from the stake and conveyed him to the village. Early in the morning he beheld the scalp of Montgomery stretched upon a hoop, and drying in the air before the door of one of their principal houses. He was quickly led out and ordered to run the gauntlet. A row of boys, women, and men extended to the distance of a quarter of a mile. At the starting place stood two grim-looking warriors with butcher knives in their hands. At the extremity of the line was an Indian beating a drum, and a few paces beyond the drum was the door of the council house. Clubs, switches, hoe handles, and tomahawks were brandished along the whole line, causing the sweat involuntarily to stream from his pores, at the idea of the discipline which his naked skin was to receive during this race. The moment for starting arrived. The great drum at the door of the council house was struck, and Kenton sprung forward in the race. He avoided the row of his enemies and, turning to the east, drew the whole party in pursuit of him. He doubled several times with great activity, and at length observing an opening, he darted through it and pressed forward to the council house with a rapidity which left his pursuers far behind. One or two of the Indians succeeded in throwing themselves between him and the goal, and from these alone he received a few blows, but was much less injured than he could at first have supposed possible. As soon as the race was over, a council was held in order to determine whether he should be burnt to death on the spot or carried round to the other villages and exhibited to every tribe. The arbiters of his fate sat in a circle on the floor of the council house, while the unhappy prisoner, naked and bound, was committed to the care of a guard in the open air. The deliberation commenced. Each warrior sat in silence while a large war club was passed round the circle. Those who were opposed to burning the prisoner on the spot were to pass the club in silence to the next warrior. Those in favor of burning were to strike the earth violently with the club before passing it. A teller was appointed to count the votes. This dignitary quickly reported that the opposition had prevailed, that his execution was suspended for the present, and it was determined to take him to an Indian town on Mad River called Wakamotoko. His fate was quickly announced to him by a renegade white man who acted as interpreter. Kenton felt rejoiced at the issue, but naturally became anxious to know what was in reserve for him at Wakadamoko. He accordingly asked the white man what the Indians intended to do with him upon reaching the appointed place. "'Burn you, damn you!' was the ferocious reply. He asked no further question, and the scowling interpreter walked away." Instantly, preparations were made for his departure, and to his great joy as well as astonishment, his clothes were restored to him, and he was permitted to remain unbound. Thanks to the ferocious intimation of the interpreter, he was aware of the fate in reserve for him, and secretly determined that he would never reach Wakadamoko alive if it was possible to avoid it. Their route lay through an unpruned forest, abounding in thickets and undergrowth. Unbound as he was, it would not be impossible to escape from the the hands of his conductors, and if he could once enter the thickets, he thought that he might be enabled to baffle his pursuers. At the worst, he could only be retaken, and the fire would burn no hotter after an attempt to escape than before. During the whole of their march, he remained abstract and silent, often meditating an effort for liberty, and as often shrinking from the peril of the attempt. At length, he was aroused from his reverie by the Indians firing off their guns and raising the shrill scalp halloo. The signal was soon answered, and the deep roll of a drum was heard far in front, announcing to the unhappy prisoner that they were approaching an Indian town where the gauntlet certainly, and perhaps the stake, awaited him. 
The idea of a repetition of the dreadful scenes which he had already encountered completely banished the indecision which had hitherto withheld him, and with a sudden and startling cry, he sprung into the bushes and fled with the speed of a wild deer. The pursuit was instant and keen, some on foot, some on horseback, but he was flying for his life. The stake and the hot iron and the burning splinters were before his eyes, and he soon distanced the swiftest hunter that pursued him, but fate was against him at every turn. Thinking only of the enemy behind, he forgot that there might also be enemies before, and before he was aware of what he had done, he found that he had plunged into the center of a fresh party of horsemen, who had sallied from the town at the firing of the guns, and happened unfortunately to stumble upon the poor prisoner, now making a last effort for freedom. His heart sunk at once from the ardor of hope, to the very pit of despair, and he was again haltered and driven before them to town like an ox to the slaughterhouse. Upon reaching the village, Pickaway, he was fastened to a stake near the door of the council house, and the warriors again assembled in debate. In a short time they issued from the council house, and surrounding him, they danced, yelled, etc. for several hours, giving him once more a foretaste of the bitterness of death. On the following morning their journey was continued, but the Indians had now become watchful and gave him no opportunity of even attempting an escape. On the second day he arrived at Wakadamoko. Here he was again compelled to run the gauntlet, in which he was severely hurt, and immediately after this ceremony he was taken to the council house, and all the warriors once more assembled to determine his fate. He sat silent and dejected upon the floor of the cabin, awaiting the moment which was to deliver him to the stake, when the door of the council house opened and Simon Gurdy, James Gurdy, John Ward, and an Indian came in with a woman, Mrs. Mary Kennedy, as a prisoner, together with seven children and seven scalps. Kenton was instantly removed from the council house, and the deliberations of the assembly were protracted to a very late hour, in consequence of the arrival of the last-named party with a fresh drove of prisoners. At length he was again summoned to the council house, being informed that his fate was decided. Regarding the mandate as a mere prelude to the stake and fire, which he knew was intended for him, he obeyed it with the calm despair which had now succeeded the burning anxiety of the last few days. Upon entering the council house, he was greeted with a savage scowl, which, if he had still cherished a spark of hope, would have completely extinguished it. Simon Gertie threw a blanket upon the floor, and harshly ordered him to take a seat upon it. The order was not immediately complied with, and Gertie impatiently seized his arm, jerked him roughly upon the blanket, and pulled him down upon it. In the same rough and menacing tone, Gertie then interrogated him as to the condition of Kentucky. How many men are there in Kentucky? It is impossible for me to answer that question, replied Kenton, but I can tell you the number of officers and their respective ranks. You can then judge for yourself. Do you know William Stewart? Perfectly well. He is an old and intimate acquaintance. What is your own name? Simon Butler, replied Kenton. Never did the enunciation of a name produce a more powerful effect. Gertie and Kenton, then bearing the name of Butler, had served as spies together in Dunmore's expedition. The former had not then abandoned the society of the whites for that of the Indians, and had become warmly attached to Kenton during the short period of their services together. As soon as he heard the name, he became strongly agitated, and springing from his seat, he threw his arms around Kenton's neck and embraced him with much emotion. Then, turning to the assembled warriors, who remained astonished spectators of this extraordinary scene, he addressed them in a short speech, which the deep earnestness of his tone and the energy of his gesture rendered eloquent. He informed them that the prisoner whom they had just condemned to the stake was his ancient comrade and bosom friend, that they had traveled the same warpath, slept upon the same blankets, and dwelt in the same wigwam. He entreated them to have compassion upon his feelings, to spare him the agony of witnessing the torture of an old friend by the hands of his adopted brothers, and not to refuse so trifling a favor as the life of a white man to the earnest intercession of one who had proved by three years' faithful service that he was sincerely and zealously devoted to the cause of the Indians. This speech was listened to in unbroken silence. As soon as he had finished, several chiefs expressed their approbation by a deep guttural interjection, while the others were equally as forward in making known their objections to the proposal. They urged that his fate had already been determined in a large and solemn council, and that they would be acting like squaws to change their minds every hour. 
they insisted upon the flagrant misdemeanors of Kenton, that he had not only stolen their horses, but had flashed his guns at one of their young men, that it was in vain to suppose that so bad a man could ever become an Indian at heart, like their brother Gertie, that the Kentuckians were all alike a very bad people, and ought to be killed as fast as they were taken, and finally they observed that many of their people had come from a distance, solely to assist at the torture of the prisoner. And pathetically painted the disappointment and chagrin with which they would hear that all their trouble had been for nothing. Gertie listened with obvious impatience to the young warriors, who had so ably argued against a reprieve, and starting to his feet as soon as the others had concluded, he urged his former request with great earnestness. He briefly but strongly recapitulated his own services, and the many and weighty instances of attachment which he had given. He asked if he could be suspected of partiality to the whites. When had he ever before interceded for any of that hated race? Had he not brought the seven scalps home with him from the last expedition, and had he not submitted seven white prisoners that very evening to their discretion? Had he expressed a wish that a single one of the captives should be saved? This was his first and should be his last request. For if they refused to him what was never refused to the intercession of one of their natural chiefs, he would look upon himself as disgraced in their eyes, and considered as unworthy of confidence. Which of their own natural warriors had been more zealous than himself? From what expedition had he ever shrunk? What white man had ever seen his back? Whose tomahawk had been bloodier than his? He would say no more. He asked it as a first and last favor, as an evidence that they approved of his zeal and fidelity, that the life of his bosom friend might be spared. Fresh speakers arose upon each side and the debate was carried on for an hour and a half, with great heat and energy. During the whole of this time, Kenton's feelings may readily be imagined. He could not understand a syllable of what was said. He saw that Gertie spoke with deep earnestness and that the eyes of the assembly were often turned upon himself with various expressions. He felt satisfied that his friend was pleading for his life and that he was violently opposed by a large part of the council. At length, the war club was produced and the final vote taken. Kenton watched its progress with thrilling emotion, which yielded to the most rapturous delight, as he perceived that those who struck the floor of the council house were decidedly inferior in numbers to those who passed it in silence. Having thus succeeded in his benevolent purpose, Gertie lost no time in attending to the comfort of his friend. He led him into his own wigwam, and from his own store gave him a pair of moccasins and leggings, a breech cloth, a hat, a coat, a handkerchief for his neck, and another for his head. The whole of this remarkable scene is in the highest degree honorable to Gertie, and is in striking contrast to most of his conduct after his union with the Indians. No man can be completely hardened, and no character is at all times the same. Gertie had been deeply offended with the whites, and knowing that his desertion to the Indians had been universally and severely reprobated, and that he himself was regarded with detestation by his former countrymen, he seems to have raged against them from these causes, with a fury which resembled the paroxysm of a maniac more than the deliberate cruelty of a naturally ferocious temper. Fierce censure never reclaims, but rather drives to still greater extremities, and this is the reason that renegades are so much fiercer than natural foes, and that when females fall, they fall irretrievably. For the space of three weeks, Kenton lived in perfect tranquility. Gertie's kindness was uniform and indefatigable. He introduced Kenton to his own family and accompanied him to the wigwams of the principal chiefs, who seemed all at once to have turned from the extremity of rage to the utmost kindness and cordiality. Fortune, however, seemed to have selected him for her football, and to have him snatched from the frying pan only to throw him into the fire. About twenty days after his most providential deliverance from the stake, he was walking in company with Gertie and an Indian named Redpole, when another Indian came from the village towards them, uttering repeatedly a whoop of peculiar intonation. Gertie instantly told Kenton that it was the distress halloo, and that they must all go instantly to the council house. Kenton's heart involuntarily fluttered at this intelligence, for he dreaded all whoops and hated all council houses firmly believing that neither boded him any good. Nothing, however, could be done to avoid whatever fate awaited, and he sadly accompanied Gertie and Redpole back to the village. Upon approaching the Indian who had hallooed, Gertie and Redpole shook hands with him. Kenton likewise offered his hand, but the Indian refused to take it, at the same time scowling upon him ominously. 
This took place within a few paces of the door of the council house. Upon entering, they saw that the house was unusually full. Many chiefs and warriors from the distant towns were present, and their countenances were grave, severe, and foreboding. Gertie, Redpole, and Kenton walked around offering their hands successively to each warrior. The hands of the two first were cordially received, but when poor Kenton anxiously offered his hand to the first warrior, it was rejected with the same scowling eye as before. He passed on to the second, but was still rejected. He persevered, however, until his hand had been refused by the first six. When sinking into despondence, he turned off and stood apart from the rest. The debate quickly commenced. Kenton looked eagerly towards Gertie as his last and only hope. His friend looked anxious and distressed. The chiefs from a distance arose one after another, and spoke in a firm and indignant tone, often looking at Kenton with an eye of death. Gertie did not desert him, but his eloquence appeared wasted upon the distant chiefs. After a warm debate, he turned to Kenton and said, "'Well, my friend, you must die.' One of the stranger chiefs instantly seized him by the collar, and the other surrounding him, he was strongly pinioned, committed to a guard, and instantly marched off. His guard were on horseback while the prisoner was driven before them on foot, with a long rope around his neck, the other end of which was held by one of the guard. In this manner, they marched about two and a half miles when Gertie passed them on horseback, informing Kenton that he had friends at the next village, with whose aid he hoped to be able to do something for him. Gertie passed on to the town, but finding that nothing could be done, he would not see his friend again, but returned to Wakatomoko by a different route. They passed through the village without halting, and at the distance of two and a half miles beyond it, Kenton had again an opportunity of witnessing the fierce hate with which these children of nature regard an enemy. At the distance of a few paces from the road, an Indian woman was busily engaged in chopping wood, while her lord and master was sitting on a log smoking his pipe, and directing her labors with the indolent indifference common to the natives, when, not under the influence of some exciting passion, the sight of Kenton, however, seemed to rouse him to fury. He hastily sprung up with a sudden yell, snatched the axe from the woman, and, rushing upon the prisoner so rapidly as to give him no opportunity of escape, dealt him a blow with the axe which cut through his shoulder, breaking the bone and almost severing the arm from his body. He would instantly have repeated the blow had not Kenton's conductors interfered and protected him, severely reprimanding the Indian for attempting to rob them of the amusements of torturing the prisoner at the stake. They soon reached a large village upon the headwaters of Scioto, where Kenton for the first time beheld the celebrated Mingo chief Logan, so honorably mentioned in Mr. Jefferson's notes on Virginia. Logan walked gravely up to the place where Kenton stood, and the following short conversation ensued. Well, young man, these young men seem very mad at you. Yes, sir, they certainly are. Well, don't be disheartened. I am a great chief. You are to go to Sandusky. They speak of burning you there, but I will send two runners tomorrow to speak good for you. Logan's form was striking and manly, his countenance calm and noble, and he spoke the English language with fluency and correctness. Kenton's spirits instantly rose at the address of the benevolent chief, and he once more looked upon himself as providentially rescued from the stake. On the following morning, two runners were dispatched to Sandusky, as the chief had promised, and until their return, Kenton was kindly treated, being permitted to spend much of his time with Logan, who conversed with him freely and in the most friendly manner. In the evening, the two runners returned and were closeted with Logan. Kenton felt the most burning anxiety to know what was the result of their mission, but Logan did not visit him again until the next morning. He then walked up to him, accompanied by Kenton's guards, and giving him a piece of bread, told him that he was instantly to be carried to Sandusky, and without uttering another word, turned upon his heel and left him. Again Kenton's spirits sunk. From Logan's manner he supposed that his intercession had been unavailing, and that Sandusky was destined to be the scene of his final suffering. This appears to have been the truth. But Fortune, who, to use Lord Lavat's expression, had been playing at cat and mouse with him for the last month, had selected Sandusky for the display of her strange and capricious power. He was driven into the town as usual, and was to have been burnt on the following morning, when an Indian agent named Drewer interposed and once more rescued him from the stake. 
He was anxious to obtain intelligence for the British commandant at Detroit, and so earnestly insisted upon Kenton's being delivered up to him that the Indians at length consented upon the express condition that after the required information had been obtained, he should again be placed at their discretion. To this Drewer consented, and without further difficulty Kenton was transferred to his hands. Drewer lost no time in removing him to Detroit. On the road he informed Kenton of the condition upon which he had obtained possession of his person, assuring him, however, that no consideration should induce him to abandon a prisoner to the mercy of such wretches. Having dwelt at some length upon the generosity of his own disposition, and having sufficiently magnified the service with which he had just rendered him, he began at length to cross-question Kenton as to the force and condition of Kentucky, and particularly as to the number of men at Fort McIntosh. Kenton very candidly declared his inability to answer either question, observing that he was merely a private, and by no means acquainted with matters of an enlarged and general import, that his great business had heretofore been to endeavor to take care of himself, which he had found a work of no small difficulty. Drewer replied that he believed him, and from that time Kenton was troubled with no more questions. His condition at Detroit was not unpleasant. He was compelled to report himself every morning to an English officer, and was restricted to certain boundaries throughout the day, but in other respects he scarcely felt that he was a prisoner. His battered body and broken arm were quickly repaired, and his emaciated limbs were again clothed with a proper proportion of flesh. He remained in this state of easy restraint from October 1777 until June of 1778, when he meditated an escape. There was no difficulty in leaving Detroit, but he would be compelled to traverse a wilderness of more than 200 miles, abounding with hostile Indians, and affording no means of subsistence beyond the wild game which could not be killed without a gun. In addition to this, he would certainly be pursued, and if retaken by the Indians, he might expect a repetition of all that he had undergone before, without the prospect of a second interposition on the part of the English. These considerations deterred him for some time from the attempt, but at length his impatience became uncontrollable, and he determined to escape or else perish in the attempt. He took his measures with equal secrecy and foresight. He cautiously sounded two Kentuckians then at Detroit, who had been taken with Boone at the Blue Licks, and had been purchased by the British. He found them as impatient as himself of captivity, and resolute to accompany him. Charging them not to breathe a syllable of their design to any other prisoners, he busied himself for several days in making the necessary preparations. It was absolutely necessary that they should be provided with arms, both for the sake of repelling attacks and for procuring the means of subsistence, and at the same time it was very difficult to obtain them without the knowledge of the British commandant. By patiently waiting their opportunity, however, all these preliminary difficulties were overcome. Kenton formed a close relationship with two Indian hunters, deluged them with rum, and bought their guns for a mere trifle. After carefully hiding them in the woods, he returned to Detroit, and managed to procure another rifle together with powder and balls, from a Mr. and Mrs. Edgar, citizens of the town. They then appointed a night for the attempt, and agreed upon a place of rendezvous. All things turned out prosperously. They met at the time and place appointed without discovery, and taking a circuitous route avoided pursuit, and traveling only during the night, they at length arrived safely at Louisville after a march of thirty days. Thus terminated one of the most remarkable adventures in the whole range of Western history. A fatalist would recognize the hand of destiny in every stage of its progress, and the infatuation with which Kenton refused to adopt proper measures for his safety, while such were practicable, and the preserving obstinacy with which he remained upon the Ohio shore until flight became useless, and afterwards in that remarkable succession of accidents, by which, without the least exertion on his part, he was alternately tantalized with the prospect of safety, then plunged again into the deepest despair. He was eight times exposed to the gauntlet, three times tied to the stake, and as often thought himself on the eve of a terrible death. All the sentences passed upon him, whether of mercy or condemnation, seemed to have been only pronounced in one council in order to be reversed in another.
Every friend that Providence raised up in his favor was immediately followed by some enemy who unexpectedly interposed and turned a short glimpse of sunshine into deeper darkness than ever. For three weeks he was seesawing between life and death, and during the whole time he was perfectly passive. No wisdom or foresight or exertion could have saved him. Fortune fought his battle from first to last, and seemed determined to permit nothing else to interfere. Scarcely had he reached Kentucky when he was embarked in a new enterprise. Colonel George Rogers Clark had projected an expedition against hostile posts of Vincennes and Kaskaskia, and invited all Kentuckians who had leisure and inclination to join him. Kenton instantly repaired to his standard, and shared in the hardship and glory of one of the boldest, most arduous, and successful expeditions which has ever graced the American arms. The results of the campaign are well known. Secrecy and celerity were eminently combined in it, and Clark shared with the common soldier in encountering every fatigue and braving every danger. Kenton, as usual, acted as a spy, and was eminently serviceable, but no incident occurred of sufficient importance to obtain a place in these sketches. From that time until the close of the Indian War in the West, Kenton was actively employed generally in a frontier station, and occasionally in serious expeditions. He accompanied Edwards in his abortive expedition against the Indian towns in 1785, and shared in Wayne's decisive campaign of 94. So that's it for this episode. This is the story of Simon Kenton's early life and Indian captivity, but Kenton would live until 1836, just two years before this book by Joseph Pritz was published. Kenton fought with George Rogers Clark at the Battle of Vincennes, which was then called Fort Sackville in February of 1779. This was one of the major victories on the Western Front of the Revolutionary War that was primarily fought against Indians who were allied with the British, including Shawnee, Delaware, and Iroquois Indians. Kenton also served in the War of 1812, where he fought at the Battle of the Thames on October 5, 1813. This was the battle where the great Shawnee chief Tecumseh was killed. Kenton was asked to identify the body of Tecumseh. He recognized the body of Tecumseh as well as another warrior named Roundhead, and seeing that the soldiers were eager to carve up Tecumseh's body, he told them that the body of Roundhead was actually that of Tecumseh, and they carved him up instead. Tecumseh was also the chief who had agitated the Creeks to go to war against the white settlers earlier in 1813. In the book that we have done a series on, The Creek War of 1813 and 1814, there are a couple of chapters that talk about Tecumseh's journey south to the Creek Nation and the civil war among the Creeks over whether or not to go to war against the white settlers. This channel is called Unworthy History because we present actual history that is now deemed unworthy to show on history channels on TV. This is the longest episode yet on this channel. I thought about making it into two parts, but the story really seemed to fit together as one incident of border life during the Revolutionary War. But let us know in the comments if you think this would have been better as a part one and part two. We present actual history on this channel by reading directly from old books, written down long ago by people whose shoes we are unworthy to stand in. If you'd like to support the mission of Unworthy History, then consider joining our Patreon page or becoming a YouTube channel member. The contribution of paid members will be recognized at the end of each episode, and members will also have access to additional members-only videos. So if you want to see more episodes like this, then be sure to like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time on Unworthy History.